seperti itu. <laughs> okay, uh, as part of our uh, series of faculty lectures from uh, recent advance surgery, uh, today we have a presentation by uh, Dr. Shomen Das, who is in charge of Onco uh, Surgery Unit at Netaji Shubhash Cancer Institute. So this will be uh, I I have selected these topics because uh, one of the uh, theory paper is recent advance surgery. So if you cover all these uh, by faculty lecture, you go through this lecture, it will be uh, easier for you to face this uh, one paper on recent advanced surgery. So today our topic will be peritoneal carcinomatosis and Dr. Shomin Dash will present. Dr. Dash, you can share screen and start. So is the screen visible, sir? Yes, yes, visible. Thank you. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. So today we'll be discussing on the peritoneal carcinomatosis. This peritoneal carcinomatosis is also known as peritoneal surface cancers. Uh, I have divided the topic in uh, different subtopics, like the definition, the investigations which we need to do, for peritoneal carcinomatosis, the staging or peritoneal carcinomatosis index and a management overview and what is the evidence we have on the management of peritoneal carcinomatosis and the most recent advanced technique in peritoneal carcinomatosis that is the pipe act because that may come as a short note. Uh, so how do you define peritoneal carcinomatosis or peritoneal surface malignancy? So these are the group of tumors which are arising from or spreading into the surface of a peritoneum with or without any solid organ involvement. This spreading can be as shedding, implantation, or dissemination, okay? So they are divided into two groups. One is a primary peritoneal carcinomatosis. Another one is secondary peritoneal carcinomatosis. So primary peritoneal carcinomatosis are those which will originate from the peritoneal surface epithelial cells, like the mesothelioma or pseudomyxoma peritoni. The secondary group are the tumor is originating in some solid organ, then it is spreading onto the surface of the peritoneum. That is from colon, appendix, and ovary. Now remember, pseudomyxoma peritonei can originate from the surface of the peritoneum, as well as it can be, uh, origin, originate in appendix or ovary, then it can spread into the peritoneal surface. Now, if we look at the natural history of peritoneal surface cancers, uh, in, in 2000, the reported five-year survival was 0%, okay? But with the advancement of several techniques, this uh, survival has uh, increased. Now, the strategy for peritoneal surface cancers, we usually, when for GI cancers, when we find a metastasis in liver from colorectal, we resect it. And so there is a curative intent of treatment in liver, lungs, adrenal or brain cancers, brain metastasis from GI cancers. But for peritoneum still now, it is a palliative care only, which um, uh, is practiced worldwide. Now, remember peritoneum is an organ. It has got, got its own blood supply and venous drainage through the portal venous system. Uh, so it needs to be addressed separately. What are the investigations we need to do to identify and to grade the peritoneal surface cancers? The CECT is the uh, first investigation which will tell us about the peritoneal carcinomatosis. Now, what are the signs of peritoneal carcinomatosis in CT scan? They can present with ascites. They can present with cake-like lesions in obentum or mesentery. This, uh, the stellate pattern in the mesentery. There can be, you, you can see the peritoneal implants directly. The scalloping of liver surface, this is very uh, interesting and important finding in case of peritoneal disease and bowel level thickening with or without obstruction. So these are the classical CT findings of peritoneal carcinomatosis. But remember the sensitivity of CCT uh, to diagnose lesions less than one centimeter is around 20 to 25 to 50%. So it is not that sensitive. For small bowel lesions, it is again uh, further low, okay? <clears throat> now, what is the role of PET scan in uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis? It has got little higher sensitivity when you combine the PET scan 
with a CT. So uh, com in combination, the sensitivity increases to the tune of 78 to 97%. You have an advantage of uh, doing PET CT to pick up extra abdominal metastasis because we know any form of local regional therapy is contraindicated if you have extra abdominal metastasis. So before you go in for a major abdominal surgery or a major rocoregional therapy, you need to rule out the extra abdominal metastasis and that is best done by a PET CT scan. Okay, It has been seen in several trials that your decision is changed in 5 to 25 percent of cases if you have done a CT scan, uh, PET CT scan. Okay, Now contrast enhanced MRI. This had got very high sensitivity, especially for pelvic lesions. It can pick up, uh, it can delineate the muscle differentiation very well. Uh, for smaller lesion, it is better visible in MRI, but it has got its own limitation like motion artifact and requirement of a trained uh, MRI radiologist, especially for GI cancers. Now, what are the tumor markers we do? For peritoneal carcinomatosis, CEA, CA 19.9 and CA 125 is routinely done but not for diagnosis. They are, they are uh, vague, they will have a vague increase. So they are not helpful for diagnosis, but still we need to do them. Why? Because it helps us in follow-up. At the baseline, you do a tumor markers, then you do your treatment, then you follow up the patient with the same tumor markers. You will see whether they are increasing or not. So you can identify the tumor research with the tumor markers, okay? Now biopsy. Biopsy nowadays for peritoneal carcinomatosis, unless and for uh, unknown primary, if, if the patient presents with ascites, omental caking, you don't know the primary, then biopsy, biopsy is a must. Usually CT or USG guided biopsy from the available area is done and it is to be uh, added with IHC, immunohistochemistry. Why? Because you need to know the primary, where from it is coming. And if it is a primary peritoneal carcinoma, like pseudomyxoma peritonei or mesothelioma, you need to know whether it is high grade or low grade, because based on that, your decision is going to change. Okay. Now you have appendicular mucinous neoplasms. That is also again diagnosed with IC and histopathology only, because if you have a high grade, there is some role of chemotherapy. If it is low grade, surgery is the only option. So that is why we need to know peritoneal carcinomatosis, which variety of it is, is it primary or secondary? And if it is primary, then what subtype it is having? So that is why this uh, biopsy is mandatory. It helps you to decide your treatment plan and it also helps you to decide on your adjuvant chemotherapy. If it is high grade, there is role of chemotherapy. If it is low grade, then no point in giving new adjuvant chemotherapy. You have to go in with surgery. Endoscopy. Endoscopy is not routinely done, but when you suspect a GI primary, especially when you have a mucinous subtype in histopathology or you have a CD, CK20 or CDX2, which are GI markers in IAC positive for omentoperitoneal disease, or when you suspect in MRI bowel invasion is there, there to rule out this bowel invasion or a bowel primary, endoscopy, especially upper GI and lower GI is indicated. <laughs> Now, how to detect peritoneal involvement? I've already told that the CT, PET CT uh, is done to detect along with MRI is done to detect the involvement or gradation of peritoneal carcinomatosis. But the final gradation or final involvement of peritoneum can be identified with laparoscopy and at lap laparotomy only because CT will always underscore the peritoneal involvement. Now, previously, this classification was used to see the peritoneal involvement. It has divided the stages into zero to four based on the tumor size, like whether it is five millimeter, less than three millimeter, five millimeter to two centimeter or more than two centimeter, along with ascites and which area, that is whether it is localized or it is diffuse. Based on this, this grading system or staging system was used. But nowadays, what uh, worldwide uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis index is used, this was proposed by uh, Professor Paul Sugarbaker, where after laparoscopy or a laparotomy, the final PCI is calculated. Okay. Now, how do we do that? Uh, go back to our old clinical days where we divide the abdomen into nine regions. Okay. So from umbilicus is zero. These are stations. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So these nine areas, nine areas along with the small bowel is divided into four groups as upper jejunum, lower jejunum, upper ileum and lower ileum. Okay. So this total 13 stations are identified. And in each station, you, when you put in your laparoscope, you see in all these 13 stations, where is the involvement and what is the grade of involvement? Okay, you identify the scoring system based on the tumor size, whether the tumor is less than two millimeter, five millimeter or more than five centimeter. Okay, so based on that, you, you decide what is the exact PCI. So what will be the minimum PCI? Minimum PCI will be the zero. And what will be the maximum PCI? So maximum is three, three into 13, 39 will be the maximum PCI. So this is based identified in laparoscopy, okay? You can have a pre-operative PCI and PCI is very important because if you have PCI for uh, colon, Cancer, for stomach cancer, you will not embark on doing a peritoneal surface surgery. But for seromyxoma, but for mesothelioma, whatever the PCI is, you go in and do the surgery. Okay. Now, what is the management plan? So PCI itself can come, come as short note. It can be a question itself. Now, what is the management plan? How do you plan your management for peritoneal cancers? Nowadays, we know uh, if you don't have any extra hepatic disease, extra abdominal disease, then the treatment of choice is uh, 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 cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. Now, I'll discuss what are those. Now, there is a fine difference between cytoreductive surgery and debulking. Debulking is when you leave behind macroscopic disease and you just debulk the tumor. Some portion of tumor is being removed. But a proper cytoreduction is actually... Actually, it means when you don't leave behind any macroscopic disease. But there is a, a, a small controversy on that because cytoreduction, after you do a cytoreduction, you see whole of the abdomen, the peritoneal surface, and you decide the completeness of cytoreduction. This is also known as CC score, cytoreduction score. When you leave behind, CC0 is when there is no evidence of any disease. CC1 is when is evidence of some disease, but they are less than 0.25 centimeter. CC2 is when you leave behind disease, which varies from 0.25 centimeter to 2.5 centimeter. And CC3 is more than 2.5 centimeter. So leaving behind more than 2.5 centimeter is a cross disease. Leaving behind 0.25 to 2.5 is okay. And this CC1, our target of doing a proper side reduction should be either a CC0 or a CC1 is acceptable. Okay. Why? I will tell you. Because when we, after doing a cytoreactive surgery, when we give high peg, this high peg chemotherapeutic agents have a penetration of up to 2.5 centimeter. So this portion, CC0, CC1, and CC2 can be taken care of by HIPEC. Okay. So this is what is known as cytoreductive surgery. Now, what is HIPEC? HIPEC is nothing but the application of hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Okay. So you, you apply highly concentrated heated chemotherapy inside the abdomen during the surgery. Okay. After you complete the cytoreduction, then you apply the heated chemotherapy. It delivers the chemotherapy directly into the abdomen, into the cancer cells. It allows higher dose of chemotherapy treatment. Okay. This also improves the absorption of chemotherapy to drug by the tumors and destroy the microscopic cancer cells that remain in the abdomen after surgery. Now, this leads, leads to the intracavitary pharmacology. That means the, this is a new domain, how the chemotherapy, we used to give chemotherapy intravenously. Some chemotherapeutic agents are given par oral, okay? But giving in uh, chemotherapy in a cavity leads, has opened up a new dimension of pharmacology called intracavitary pharmacology. Now, this uh, chemotherapeutic agent, when it is given inside the abdomen directly, it has got several advantages. Like you give high regional low systemic concentration of chemotherapeutic agent. Okay, so it will have a low systemic toxicity. Fine. 
Now, there is a peritoneal plasma barrier which will help you to keep the chemotherapeutic agent inside the abdomen and there will be li limited systemic effect. Whatever amount is being absorbed from the peritoneal surface or from the through the portal circulation, that will go to liver. Now, we know the commonest site of metastasis from abdominal cancers is liver. So if even if you have small micrometastases there in the liver, that will be taken care of by these chemotherapeutic agents, which are being absorbed through the portal circulation. Okay, so these are the advantages of giving chemotherapy directly into the abdomen. Now, why heated chemotherapy? Because hyperthermia or heat has got several effects, like it can direct cause direct destruction of the tumor cell. It increases the lipos lysosomal activity. Uh, finally, there will be complete inhibition of oxidative metabolism and the cell will die. So heat can directly kill the cell. Heat can potentiate the effect of the chemotherapy. Okay. Now, which uh, uh, chemotherapy should we use and what is the degree of tissue penetration? I told you that penetration of these high-peak chemotherapy is three to five millimeter. So even if we keep leave behind 2.5 millimeter or up to five millimeter tumor in the abdomen, it is okay because that will be taken care of by the high -peg. Now, which drug we should select for high -peg? This drug should have this following criteria. What are those? This drug should be heat stable, stable because I'm heating the temperature, uh, increasing the temperature. So drug should not be destroyed. It should be a heat stable drug there should be a thermal enhancement of the potency of the drug, okay? Now, it should have a lack of severe direct local toxicity. You are applying it directly in the tissue. So it should not have toxicity to the uh, normal tissue. Otherwise, there will be severe damage of the uh, bowel, severe damage of the several other solid organs inside the abdomen, okay? Drugs which will require metabolic activation. This is not uh, um, applicable for high peg because the activation will not be there. Okay, now you need to select a drug which is at all effective for this kind of cancers which you are dealing with. So your uh, chemotherapeutic agent uh, which are used in high peg should have all these criteria. Then only you ca you can use it um, for high peg. Till now, off level data shows that mitomycin C. Doxorubicin, cisplatin, oxaliplatin has got a uh, few of the uh, 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 properties. These are the three drugs which are very commonly used in HIPEC. Okay. Now, this is very important. What are the indications of CRS and HIPEC? Pseudomyxoma, peritonei, mesothelioma. These two, there is no doubt at all. They are the only treatment of pseudomyxoma, peritonei, and mesothelioma if they are limited to am abdomen only is CRS and HIPEC. That is the gold standard treatment for pseudomyxoma and mesothelioma of uh, peritoneal cavity. <laughs> now for colon or appendiceal cancers, if you have a PCI score, peritoneal carcinomatosis index score less than 20, no extra abdominal metastasis, limited small bowel disease, and a patient with a good performance status, there the HIPEC and CRS is indicated. In ovary, stage three and onwards or recurrent ovary, non-extra abdominal disease, their CRS and HIPEC is indicated, okay? For stomach, the limb use is limited. When there is metastasis in the peritoneal surface, in case of stomach, there most of the times you will have extra abdominal metastasis or gross liver metastasis or some contraindications of HIPEC are there. That is why the use of CRS HIPEC is limited. But still, if you have a good operable stomach with a limited peritoneal disease, yes, there is role of CRS and HIPEC. Now, let us come to what are the other indications. As a second look surgery, that means patient has underwent a colon surgery or a rectal surgery. Now patient received adjuvant chemotherapy and comes to you with the following uh, criteria, like patient had a T4 tumor, positive peritoneal cytology during the primary operation, a colon tumor with ovarian involvement, peritoneal seeding on serosal surface of the primary cancer, okay, that is a T4A or B, adjacent organ involvement. So if you find this uh, operable or surgical nodes by the primary surgeon given, then you need to go in again 
and you need to do a CRS and HIPEC. It has been seen that giving systemic chemotherapy only is the, in these situations, a versus CRS HIPEC will have some benefit, okay? Now, during operation, if the tumor was perforated, intraoperative rupture or necrotic tumor mass, limited peritoneal spilling or intraoperative tumor spill. So these are the indications and this information only is only available in the surgical note, note of the primary surgeon. So you can always ask for a note when you get a, uh, a referral for these patients and you need to do a relook surgery CRS HIPEC in these patients, okay? Now this is very important. What are the contraindications of HIPEC? First of all, this is a big surgery, so patient needs to be fit for surgery. A poor GC, a PS2 and even PS2 is okay. PS3 onwards is not okay, okay? Now, presence of extraperitoneal disease, this is a contraindication, absolute contraindication for peritoneal carcinomatosis. Diffuse and widespread peritoneal carcinomatosis inside the abdomen when there is extensive small bowel or mesenteric involvement that makes it inoperable, okay? When you have an extensive disease in the hepatoduodenal ligament in the porta where you cannot separate the peritoneum from the underlying structures or when you have extensive lymph nodal metastasis in that area especially from carcinoma stomach, that makes it inoperable. Liver metastasis is a relative contraindication. When you have operable liver metastasis, there you can do CRS HIPEG in the same sitting. Biliary or ureteric obstruction, again, they are relative contraindications. You can take care of them first, then you can go for CRS and HIPEG. And you buy some time giving the patient neurogen and chemotherapy to see what is the biology whether the tumor is increasing or not. If the tumor is increasing after neurogen chemotherapy, that makes it inoperable or unfit for CRS and HIPEC. So these are the contraindications. Now a brief uh, idea about the technique of HIPEC, how that uh, HIPEC is done. A formal midline laparotomy is done. Then the assessment of PCI based on, based on your uh, visible finding, whether the PCI is amenable to CRS HIPEC or not, then a systemic peritoneectomy is done, starting from right anterior peritoneectomy, left anterior peritoneectomy, right hypochondrium, left hypochondrium, pelvic peritoneectomy. Systematically, they are done. This is a video. I'm skipping this. So how the peritoneectomy is done. This is another video of uh, hypochondrial peritoneectomy. And this is the pouch of Douglas. This portion is blood, urinary bladder. And uh, this is the pouch of Douglas, which you need to clear. So this is pelvic peritoneal. Okay. This is again pelvic peritoneal, uh, diaphragmatic peritoneal. So after uh, removing the peritoneum, this is the picture. This is the pouch of Douglas again. This is the pouch of bladder. And this is the rectum. And this portion needs to be removed. So if you find the disease is studded there in the pulse of Douglas, you can add an anterior dissection along with your uh, surgery, but you need to clear this because these are the very common sites of recurrence. Okay. These are very common sites of recurrence. Omental barsa, you need to do greater and lesser omentectomy, need to clear the omental barsa. Okay. So that is how the uh, complete peritoneectomy is done. Gleason's capsule, when they are Gross involvement of Gleason's capsule is there, it is to be removed. Mesentery and small bowel, if you have limited small bowel disease, you can either arga, argon plasma coagulate them or you can resect a part of small bowel. But when there is extensive small bowel involvement, there, then it becomes uh, inoperable for CRS or HIPE. Okay. Organ resection, limited organ resection is advocated like anterior dissection. While doing a pelvic uh, dissection, uh, you find the pouch of Douglas is studied with the rectum. You, you go ahead with anterior dissection. You can do a limited liver dissection. Very often we need to remove spleen because the splenic hilum is studied with the disease. So spleen, splenectomy is also indicated along with. Here, a small bit of liver was taken in continuity with the colon. So this is how it looks like after a proper peritoneectomy. You need to remove the whole of the peritoneum, especially for pseudomyxoma and mesothelioma. No parietal peritoneum should be there, okay? Now, after you have done a proper cytoreduction, then you need to apply HIPEC, hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. 
the, the, we have a special device through which the hype is delivered okay there are two methods of giving it one is closed another one is open method closed means after applying all the tubings you close the abdomen then you switch on the machine open means you you connect all the tubings and keep the abdomen open so this is the basic fund of closed and open this is sugar baker technique or open technique and parmel technique is the closed technique okay and this is another this is an open technique so these are the tubings which are connected with the abdomen and that is how the hypex is given so these are the tubes and this is how you uh, open the abdomen and keep the abdomen uh, abdominal wall uh, 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 intact and these are the tubes through which the hypex uh, is being delivered i'll come to the machine this is the machine to the machine you see these are the chemotherapeutic agents okay the funda is from chemotherapeutic agents it will pass through a machine where it will it will increase the temperature and the temperature will be at least 41 degree celsius okay and to that the chemotherapeutic agent is delivered inside the abdomen via one tube uh, another tube will receive that chemotherapeutic agent and recycle it okay so these are the tubings and recycle it so what you are giving inside the abdomen is a heated solution and what uh, is creating this heat this machine is creating the heat it and circulating it inside the abdomen and it is again a pump is uh, sucking the whole thing in into the machine again and recycling it okay and the whole process goes on for 1 hour to 90 minutes what is the crux of a good hypex you need to have a temperature of 41 degree celsius at least you should have a flow of 2 liter per minute you should have proper contact and adequate contact time okay and contact time for uh, a proper hypex some cancers will respond in 19 min 90 minutes the recommendation is most of the cancer it is 90 minutes in some situations uh, 60 minutes is also advocated so this is the crux 41 degree celsius 2 liter per minute flow and adequate contact time of more than 60 minutes okay now this is what are the complications Com this is a major surgery so it will have its own complications it is shown that the morbidity is around 20 to 35% the mortality varies between 0.8 to 4.1% uh there are some classical hypex specific complications i am discussing them only apart from complications early immediate post op those divisions you can do but i am highlighting only hypex specific complications uh you will have neutropenia neutropenia is based due to the chemotherapeutic agent itself some amount is absorbed in the systemic circulation and it will cause neutropenia in 30 to 40 uh, percent of patients gi fistulas and intra abdominal abscess uh, it is not that common around 5 5 percent gi fistulas or intra abdominal abscess can occur this is due to uh, lowering of immunity gi bleed especially with oxaliplatin when it is used gi bleed is higher so uh, tranexamic acid etc is to be given pneumonia is a known complication for any major surgery but since you are keeping the patient in uh, head down position when you are doing a pelvic surgery the pneumonia chances of pneumonia is increased and some bit of uh, hypex chemotherapeutic agent is being absorbed that is why the pneumonia is higher renal insufficiency is pretty common when you are uh, giving cisplatin as a <coughs> hypex solution hypex chemotherapeutic agent uh while giving cisplatin the urine output should be measured by the anesthetist you need to have a good team of anesthetist who are experienced in hypex you need to increase the fluid intake you need to flush the kidney very frequently during the cisplatin installation okay you can prevent it one interesting uh, complication is benign post operative intrahepatic cholestasis we reported this this is a serial increase in the uh bilirubin level both direct and indirect without any increase in the um, uh, enzymes so it is not directly liver damage but you are you are giving chemotherapy that can create a liver problem so it is not so it's a benign increase in the bilirubin level starts at day 
then it increases up to day five and day six, then it gradually goes down. This is called benign postoperative intrahepatic cholestasis. Now, the reason behind this is postulated that we keep the one probe just over the liver. Okay, just over the liver, the suction probe. So, what happens? The chemotherapeutic agents they flow through on the surface of the liver. They, they can cause a direct intrahepatic cholestasis. This is transient, but a very interesting uh, complication. It, it doesn't require any treatment. It will go, um, it will be normalized on its own. Now, what is the evidence based on which we are saying that this is the, this should be the treatment of choice for peritoneal cancers? Uh, that the research started way back in 2000, 2003. Now, uh, 2003, not 1993, the research started, and we have gone a long way. And all these studies, they are showing a benefit of survival, overall survival benefit of at least at least 20, 30 or 40 percent so you see i told you previously in 2000 the five-year survival was zero percent now you see the overall survival has gone up to 30 to 41 percent so there is an increasing trend after giving intraperitoneal chemotherapy so it 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 does have a survival benefit okay now there is a recent controversy on role of hypeg in colorectal cancer so i would like to Take you through one study called Prodig 7 trial. Okay, this trial has compared cytoreductive surgery only versus cytoreductive surgery plus hypeg. Okay, so and in one arm, one arm you have colorectal cancers with peritoneal disease. Another, this is the uh, um, uh, sample criteria. There, one group undergoes cytoreductive surgery only. And another group undergoes CRS plus hype. Okay. Now remember, only colon specific surgery was not done. A proper cytoreduction. That means a colonic surgery along with peritoneectomy, omentectomy, necessary organ, organ resection was done. So CRS versus CRS plus hype in colorectal peritoneal metastasis. Okay. What they have shown that a survival benefit of overall survival, OS means overall survival, of 41 months versus 41.7 months. So they are comparable. So they have concluded that adding hypeg, adding hypeg in colorectal peritoneal carcinoma will not have any added benefit. But CRS, a proper CRS will definitely have benefit because you see the waste benefit is 41% and 41% in CRS hypeg group. So adding hypeg will not be beneficial, but doing a proper CRS is definitely beneficial. Okay. But the study was criticized, grossly criticized. Why? Because the sample size was small and oxaliplatin was used because in colon cancers, we routinely do mitomycin C or a cisplatin based chemotherapy. Here, oxaliplatin is good for colorectal IV chemotherapy, but oxaliplatin has got several problems when it is given and with hype. So that is why it was criticized. And the time was 60 minutes. I told you the time should be 90 minutes for gross uh, peritoneal involvement. That is why this study was criticized. But at least this study has shown a benefit of doing cytoreductive surgery in peritoneal colorectal cancers. They have a subgroup analysis, unplanned subgroup analysis, where they showed a HIPEC was better in PCI between 10 to 15. So the conclusion from this study is, if you are planning for CRS HIPEC in a colorectal uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis, your drug of choice should not be oxaliplatin, and your time should be more than 60 minutes, number one. And if you are using oxaliplatin, you can use that in PCI between 10 to 15. So that's the conclusion, okay? We have several other studies like HYPEC-4. Next year only the result of this will come out. This is an ongoing study with mitomycin C for colorectal cancers. You know, don't need to go into the details of it. Now, what happens when we detect an irresectable uh, uh, peritoneal cancers? The, in that case, we have two options. Either putting the patient on palliative chemotherapy or doing something else. 
Now, there comes the role of PIPEC. This is a very new development in the management of uh, peritoneal cancers. Pressurized intraperitoneal aerosol chemotherapy. Okay. What you do, you do a laparoscopy. Through the laparoscopic port, you apply pressurized aerosol chemotherapy. How do you do that? This is the device. So this is a laparoscopy you have done. And this is the device. You have a pen-like structure. That is, that is nothing but an aerosolizer that will convert a liquid into aerosol. How? This one is the generator. Generator means injector. We know during CT scan, the contrast is injected via an injector. So it pushes the liquid through an aerosolizer in very high speed. So what happens? This liquid becomes an aerosol. Why aerosol? Aerosol has got higher surface penetration. This chemo chemotherapy, which is aerosolized, it can spread inside the abdomen in an uniform manner. You don't need to do aerosolysis after going inside the abdomen. So at the beginning of CRS HIPEC, you do a laparoscopy, you find the disease is inoperable. There is widespread disease, gross uh, uh, ascites, along with gross small bowel or, or uh, mesentic involvement. There comes the role of doing a pipec. You can do a pipec, and this is the, uh, the whole setup. This is a laparoscopy port and another port where through which the capnopen, this is called capnopen, is uh, connected with a CT scan injector, the same injector which we use for a CT scan uh, contrast pushing. So that same injector, it, it pushes the chemotherapeutic agent in very high speed through the capnopen and the capnopen converts the liquid into an aerosol. That aerosol goes inside the abdomen. And this is the inside view of the capnopen, okay? Now, what is the evidence? Evidence of PIPAC. Now, PIPAC was initially, these are the trials which are going on. Uh, PIPAC was initially started as palliation because they have shown that when you have diffuse intraabdominal disease, disease is inoperable. If you give systemic chemotherapy, the effect is less because all these tumors has gone into a dormant phase. They are not in proliferation phase. That is why the chemotherapy is not acting. So there, if you apply them, apply the aerosol chemotherapy directly inside the abdomen, the palliation is better. It has been shown that if you give two, three cycles of PIPAC in new adjuvant setting, that is not hypercable cases, new adjuvant is given and new adjuvant PIPAC is applied and the tumor has shrunk down. Now you can do a CRS HIPEC. Some people, they have punched the PIPAC with systemic chemotherapy. PIPAC first cycle followed by two cycles of chemotherapy. Then again, PIPAC second cycle, another two cycles of systemic chemotherapy. Then you see how the tumor is behaving. If it is going down, fine. Even if it is not going down, if you can increase the survival to the tune of six months to one year in these patients where they are about to die in one month is a benefit, okay? So with that, uh, these are the gross uh, overview of peritoneal carcinomatosis. And I think I have covered the topic uh, with not much of boring you people. Yes, so thank yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes, very nice. Very comprehensive coverage. Because uh, this is the idea. The students should have a uh, gross idea about the disease and they should be able to write a theoretical answer. So I did not find anything in the chat box. But uh, actually, uh, Roman, if, if you have a disease uh, which is locally advanced in view of the primary tumor and uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis, what should be the strategy? Should be a straightaway pipec with a high pack with a primary surgery or it should be new adjuvant? So for sir, colon or yeah, colon, for, colon or rectum? Yes, for rectum locally advanced, that means uh, if if we detect it beforehand, before operation. Yeah. Say for example, a rectum with a surface uh, involvement or a ovarian involvement, then this becomes a direct candidate for CRS and HIPEC. Okay. Because the other organ involvement is there or def definite peritoneal disease is there. There is another thought that where HIPEC is not available, we can go ahead with colectomy in the same city. Colectomy, after colectomy, give systemic chemotherapy, see how the patient is behaving. 
if the ca is high still peritoneal disease is there then hypex is done later on okay so you you uh, the, the the group of patient who are earlier considered as not operable or nothing can be done they can be offered a uh, this therapy for uh, crs and hypex yes and then uh, the 40% five year survival is very good yes 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 Dr. Borshak, any comment? I personally have no idea. I've never done one HIPEC, but uh, I know the new things are coming and they will uh, help mankind. Uh, and Swoman is doing good thing um, in the hospital. I know that. And uh, very good, Swoman. Thank you. Swoman, how is the series like now? Your series of HIPEC and CRS? It, it has crossed 25 now. Good. You must have a good follow-up. Yes. I have got one question. Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. What is the actual cost and um, what is the operating time and what is the recovery time? And you do operate and you remove the uh, whole peritoneum. Uh, and what is your operating time? So our, our, in our series, the most of the cancers are ovary. That too in the intervening, uh, interval debunking time. That means the second look surgery. So okay. for that, the usual time is five hours. For ovary, the recovery is a little bit big, uh, better because the organ resection, etc., less. Okay, yes, so yes, five, yes, hours, right. five hours is the minimum time. We do omentectomy and peritoneectomy. <coughs> and anterior resection is added, plus minus splenectomy. If you do splenectomy, then it takes another one or two hours extra. So five hours is the minimum operating time. The median operating time was 5.7 or something like that because we did an interim analysis. Uh, the recovery patient stays in ICU for two to three days. After that, if there is no bowel fistula, if there is no pneumonia, we ship the patient to ward. And at day seven, we discharge the patient. But for colon, the real bad thing is stomach, especially the signet ring cell. And the now guideline has come that signet ring cell, you should not venture uh, a CRS hypex. So I, I stomach... totally agree with you, Soman. Stomach carcinoma is very aggressive, very aggressive, and it, it, it response is very poor in any in, in, in any advanced stomach cancer, you know. Stomach yes. and esophagus, the response is very poor, whatever you do. Yes, yes. So from esophagus, uh, it is very rare that you will have an isolated peritoneal disease. The, by that time, peritoneal disease is there. There is a lot of other systemic metastasis. Yes, yes. So for stomach, you can have a uh, isolated peritoneal disease. There, nowadays, recommendation is go for chemotherapy. You go for systemic chemotherapy, see the tumor yes. biology. If the uh, cancer remains stable, there is no increase uh, in the tumor burden, disease is stable disease or regressing, and patient has a good PS, non-signatory, then you go and do an CRS uh, And Someone what is the cost it? of this therapy in your institutions? Uh, it is at 6 lakhs. Uh, six lakhs. Someone, can you see a question in the chat box? Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. is no better than HIPEC. I will tell you. HIPEC is mandatory aerosol can spread into abdominal only where systemic circulation is spreading into the whole body as well. Fine. So PIPEC is not a substitute of HIPEC or it is not better than HIPEC. PIPEC is used, PIPEC is used when you cannot do HIPEC. So for, uh, for peritoneal cancers, the treatment of choice is CRS and HIPEC. I told that when it is unresectable, when you cannot do a proper cytoreduction, you can do PIPEC. You can apply PIPEC. Okay. Then you have to review and see how it is responding. How it is responding. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Dash. Thank it you. was a nice uh, lecture and uh, as a touch of your uh, own uh, performance also. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.